transforming the landscape of teacher education. Uh, and my title refers to landscape as the title of the colloquium series does. As you can probably tell from my voice, I'm not from around here. So my landscapes are different to yours. Um, partly this one. So this is the landscape of Norway and the fjords, where I work part-time at the Hogskola in Bergen in high school, which is the kind of college in Norway that trains most teachers, primary, all elementary school teachers and some secondary school teachers. Uh, in the main, this is my landscape, the landscape of England. That is not London, that is the Lake District. But I work at Brunel University in London, where I'm the head of a new department of education. And only slightly this landscape, which is the Hudson Valley, um, where I've studied some teacher education programs in the United States as part of some comparative research on the pedagogies of teacher education for urban schools. The thing about landscapes is they look very alike. Mountains, trees, water, small dots that are people in, traveling in boats on the water. But the features of these landscapes and the figures in them have very different meanings. And what lies underneath in terms of geological layers is also different. Different kinds of sedimentation that have built up over different time scales. So in what follows, you'll have to be aware that I'm saying, what I'm saying refers mainly to landscapes on another continent. And when I've finished, I hope you'll talk to me about what is and isn't in common here in the United States. I feel very honored to have been invited to talk tonight, as I've said, and to have the opportunity to talk with and learn from colleagues in the Department of Curriculum Teaching and more widely. Teachers College has a particular importance as a specialist institution that has led the field internationally as well as within the United States. Its very name, Teachers College, continues to signal to the world the importance of teachers and teacher educators as well as signaling the importance of the academic study of teaching and teacher education, signaling these things to the profession of teaching, to higher education, and to society more generally. Teachers and teacher educators are social scientists from one perspective, of course, and I, like many of you, I expect, have spent many years developing my social science in an academic context. But first and still, I'm a teacher and a teacher educator, and proud to say that. Proud to claim teaching and teacher education as human activities that are simultaneously practical and intellectual. The work of hand and mind, as Mike Rose would say, whilst also perhaps being some of the most significant tools of public policy in many countries around the world today. Uh, as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development have said, and the clue there is in their name, of course, teachers matter. And as the OECD also implied, teacher educators matter too. What teacher educators do, their work, how they contribute to the preparation of teachers has become tremendously important. Pauline Musset, writing for the OECD in 2010, called it the amazing challenge of teacher education. And the OECD's judgment, among others, has focused great attention on what we do, our work. Our work as teacher educators challenges and sometimes frustrates policymakers around the world, especially those who suffer from what might be called PISA envy. The, fi the fixation with measurement by the OECD's program for international student assessment and their collation into international league tables of measurement. Our challenge and their frustration is expressed in many different forms, of course. And some of them seem to be designed to marginalize higher education-based teacher educators or to remove them from the process of teacher preparation altogether. Recently, this has involved innovative experiments like the Relay Graduate School of Education here in this city or the Spasato Graduate School in Massachusetts, where alternative forms of higher education have been established to deliver a different sort of te teacher preparation focused on student outcomes represented by test scores, requiring a very different meaning for higher education, perhaps, and a very different sort of work on the part of the teacher educator compared to a teacher educator who works somewhere like Teachers College. Other alternative forms of teacher education, such as Teach for America, now part of the 32-country Teach for All project, 
and some of the new urban teacher residencies do have a different relationship with higher education, but frustratingly perhaps for reformers, a relationship nonetheless. Summer schools for Teach for America, master's level coursework for UTRs are provided by universities in partnership, and these alternative providers use universities to deliver the kinds of reforms that their funders want, albeit on the basis of competitive tendering, and some might say a race to the bottom in terms of both cash and quality. The landscape is complex, and although sometimes the grass looks fresh and new, uh, it's sometimes the same rocks underneath it. But the frustrating thing for both policymakers with PISA envy and ideologically driven reformers alike is that universities continue to be involved, even if somewhat hidden by a reformist rhetoric. Because in the end, as we have learned in England, it's the universities that have the capacity to do this sort of work at scale and compared to the alternatives cheaply and relatively efficiently. That's certainly the English experience. I can't say I know that to be true here. But what our policymakers in England have learned, particularly over the last four years, is that if you mess with the present system, a system in which universities since 1992 have played an important, but by no means the most important part, if you mess with the system, it'll cost you more. You will risk teacher shortages, especially in urban areas and in maths and science and you contribute to the very real problem that we do have in teacher education in England, which is retaining teachers in the profession. 40% leave within the first three years in England. So messing with the system exacerbates these problems. That's why uh, teacher education continues to be at the center of what seems like a perpetual reform crisis. What teacher educators do matters. We know that and so do they. And as you can tell, I've already started positioning myself and indeed you in this argument with these references to reformers and to us and them. So right at the beginning of the talk, I want to say that I'm not going to be defensive of the status quo in pre-service teacher education in England or anywhere else. I won't seek simply to defend what has gone on in universities under the name of what we call initial teacher education in England. When talking about education generally, it's become very common to fall into a familiar rhetorical trap. Neoliberalism and the specific policy term that Stephen Ball calls the global education reform movement, the germ, presents ur urgent arguments in the public sphere that are presented as reform ideas. They are strongly and explicitly motivated. They often appear well-intentioned and they're articulated with great eloquence and fervor. These reform ideas frame proposals that have easily recognizable and indeed well-intentioned outcomes, and the outcomes are measurable through the specification of targets and numerical benchmarks. The modality of reform is one that's become known in England as new public management or management by objectives. The trap for those who have an alternative view is one of simply defending current arrangements, of arguing that there is evidence that these arrangements are good enough, and that the risks associated with changing things are too high. Statistical and methodological critiques are traded in skirmishes, the terms of which have already been set by the reformers. The germ has determined the ground on which the argument takes place, its premises, propositions, and overall conclusions. Debates about teacher education have often followed this pattern. And in the book on which the talk is based, my colleague Jay McNichol and I talk about some of the reasons. We're talking about the situation in England, of course, and I'll be interested to hear your views about how much of what I say is relevant to the United States. But in summary, I believe that teacher education as a field within the higher education discipline of education has been somewhat conservative in its approach in its own development. I don't blame teacher educators for the situation, nor do I want to apportion blame elsewhere. In the book, we seek to offer an analysis of the situation as it has arisen culturally and historically, and we then propose some ideas for the development of the field that will be of benefit to the education system as a whole, as well as to the academic discipline and to teacher educators as an occupational group. So tonight, I will not be defending teacher education as it is. I want to try to work towards a transformative agenda. 
my rejection of this reform defend dichotomy, a dichotomy I think you've already heard Ken Zeitner talk about, and my commitment to the transformation of existing arrangements uh, has been stimulated by the work of many scholars. Littman, Pauline Littman, 2011 book, The New Political Economy of Urban Education, was particularly influential on my thinking. Uh, writing about urban education and about Chicago public schools in particular, Littman argued for the necessity of, quotes, rupturing the neoliberal trope that opposition means supporting the status quo. In place of a defensive stance, Littman proposed a transformative one, one that opened out the debate to the wider society and engaged children, parents, and communities. She proposed a category of what she called non-reformist reforms that intervened in the ruptures between defensive and reformist positions. Fundamentally, she argued for a reframing of the arguments as the first step in, quotes, fracturing the he hegemonic alliance that supports the germ, asserting that how issues are framed sets the parameters of possible solutions, defines who is responsible, and embodies the sort of society we wish to have. Cognitive linguist George Lakoff has made similar, uh, similar proposals for reframing the arguments of left and right in our general politics. No matter how much data, no matter how much evidence one produces from a defensive standpoint, the power of the reformer's framing metaphor is always determining. So this book, this talk, takes a different path. There are three sections to the talk, and in the first I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history, culture, and politics of pre-service teacher education in England. I want to suggest that as a field, we struggle to break away from some of the historically sedimented cultural practices, forms of community, and sense of identity that have characterized teacher education as a pioneering form of mass higher education that began at the turn of the 19th century. Second, I will talk a little about some recent research into the work of teacher educators in England. And in the third and final part, I will try to suggest an agenda for transforming teacher education, an agenda that involves reconfiguring the academic work. And I'll also try to finish by about eight so that we have a chance to discuss them. Throughout what follows, uh, I'm gonna talk quite often about the profession of teaching. One of the concerns that Jane McNichol and I shared when writing the book was that so much recent policy and indeed so much of what teacher educators have written about themselves, is concerned with preparing people to work in school, in a school, to preparing people to be in a workplace. Often it is presented as people, preparing people to, quote, make a difference in the setting in which they're learning to teach, the high needs, quotes, or challenging school in particular. This is seductive rhetoric, especially for idealistic people with a social conscience but is also tremendously limiting, focused on the one school, focused on arming student teachers with a battery of high leverage instructional practices or teacher moves, focusing on the short term, focusing on the individual teacher. I will talk about the profession of teaching, a collective phenomenon, one that carries with it rights and responsibilities concerned with a professional knowledge base, rights and responsibilities both to access that knowledge base, to develop it, challenge it, and make it anew. I want to see teacher education as a preparation to join the profession and the teacher educator's role as an ally and critical friend, someone with a specifically academic contribution to make to the wider profession of teachers. In the end, I want a strong profession as well as a strong higher education field of teacher education. They're different. They're different occupational groups with different primary objects, but I will argue that by working together differently, both will be stronger. This is where I go off piste. If I talk a little bit about the history of teaching as a profession and teacher education in higher education, I can talk about where I work in so my institution, Brunel University, one of the predecessor colleges was the Borough Road School and College that was founded in the East End of London in 1798. Uh, it was founded by a Quaker society to provide education for poor children. And in 1817, they
they founded the college to train teachers for the school. And it was the first teacher training college in the British Commonwealth. It was founded by a man called Joseph Lancaster, that you may have heard of the Lancasterian system. Sometimes he's thought of as a very progressive figure. Uh, one of the reasons is he didn't beat children with sticks, which was very popular at the time. Um, however, he did haul children to the roof of the classroom in a cage if they did misbehave, I'm not joking, or put them in a sack and tie the top. So I think we've got to be careful when we're talking about kind of progressive histories of our own institutions. If you look at the history, you see what are called pupil teacher centres growing up in the middle of the 19th century in England. This is where the bright children in a class would be selected by the teacher and apprenticed to the teacher. They might be 13, 14 years old, and then would go off to the pupil teacher centre and do a little bit of extra work, sometimes supervised by a group of people in England called the Majesty's Inspectors of Schools. And one of those was the poet Matthew Arnold. In 1870, we had the Elementary Education Act, which moved the right to elementary education across the whole of the population. Before that, it was a small section of the population that had been taught by these religious societies that started their schools. So what happened? You needed many, many more teachers. And so we had to figure out how do we create more teachers for new kinds of schools. So in 1890, you see day training colleges established. And the day training colleges are a very um, important feature of our historical landscape. Many of the um, elite British universities have their origins in day training colleges. So Imperial College London, a big science and technology and medicine university, has its origin in the South Kensington Day Training College. Uh, the Institute of Education, the specialist institute in London, was the London Day Training College. And what you see then in the early part of the 20th century are the expansion of these, what became colleges of education. And they were at the vanguard of providing higher education for a much larger group. Because as you probably know, the British, the English especially, have traditionally educated quite a, a small proportion of the population, especially through universities. It was a, an elite system. So you find colleges of education that became very powerful levers for social change in our country. And I'm going to show you a little clip here from a play called Prin by Andrew Davis. Andrew Davis, you might know as a screenwriter, if you ever watch PBS, anything with a costume and a rough, he's probably adapted that. He's made his fortune by adapting things like Pride and Prejudice and George Eliot novels and so on. Uh, he started doing that while he was a teacher educator. He was a teacher educator at the Coventry College of Education, and it became Warwick University. So you might have heard of Warwick University. It's one of the Russell Group universities in England. Uh, but Andrew Davis worked in Coventry College of Education in the 1970s, at a time when there was a lot of change going on, but also you still had this strong residual culture of these colleges that grew up in the 19th century, often, very often, led by women, that had a very strong view of what a teacher education was about. So this character is Prin. We don't know her first name. Prin is sort the principal. That's what she's known as. And this is part of her speech on the last day to the qualifying teachers.
So in these training colleges, and Prynne was one of the last, the principal, one of the last of the best independent colleges, as she put it, um, you see this cultivation of cultivated people. You, know, you become a good person, you're allowed to become a teacher because you share good taste. It's based on a strongly charismatic pedagogy. You see the rise of a professional class at the same time. It's a professional lower middle class because we like our society stratified in, in England. You prioritize, hmm? unlike in the United States, uh, I don't know, prioritizing the right kind of experience for the right sort of person for the right sort of state. So in fact, if you look at England and you look at Ireland and you look at Canada and Australia, you do see the, the, the teachers having an important function in taking the idea of a nation to parts of what was the British Empire. But you also see these colleges producing teachers that are going to be producing a new sort of child, a new sort of worker, the sort of morally and ethically self-regulating person that can survive in a new industrial society, as Thomas Popkin was called. So you see these colleges having a very particular social role. And it's not a role that looks or sounds necessarily like anything like a modern form of higher education. We have a rel relatively recent history of mass higher education in England as well. And that's very important. One of the things that I think certainly gets lost in the English work, I'm not sure about the United States, when we write about teacher education, we study teacher education, we often see it on its own. We see it outside the rest of the higher education system. We see it more in relation to schools, perhaps, than we do in relation to the rest of the university. So we've tried to kind of move this back by studying the development of the higher education system. And actually, the very important place that teacher training colleges, day training colleges, had in that in England. Because you'll hear some people say that education and teacher education has come late to universities hasn't. It was right there at the start. It was the mass form of higher education. Subjects like English and history and geography in England, they came late. The first English degree at Oxford was in 1895. It was designed quotes for women and those third-rate men who would become school teachers. So English came late. Teacher education was right in there at the start. And that's often sometimes flipped in when we write about teacher education in England. But if you look at higher education, if we look at the late 20th century, you find the Robbins Report. And the Robbins Report is going to be um, 50 years old very soon. That led to a very large expansion of universities that were called plate glass universities. So my university, Brunel University London, is a plate glass university like Sussex, Surrey, University of York, University of East Anglia, all founded in 1966 with the purpose of expanding this system that took in about sort of 4 to 6% of the population and taking it up to about 11 or 12%. The Robbins Report was followed in 97 by the Deering Report. It was started by a Conservative government but actually enacted by Tony Blair. And that was a, a much larger expansion. The goal then was that 50% of the British population would have a higher education. And of course, how do you fund that in a system which was entirely funded through general taxation? You introduced tuition fees, which were 3,000 pounds in 1998, regardless of which institution you attended. In 2010, our current government, led by David Cameron, instituted the Brown Review of Higher Education, and that raised fees to 9,000 pounds a year, again, comparatively cheap, but a significant change for us, and a change that hasn't really worked its way through our system. If you add to that, in the 20th century, the research assessment exercise, which is now known as the Research Excellence Framework, where each of us, academics in England, are monitored on our research productivity and quality. So on December the 17th this year, I will open an envelope and I will find out how my department has been graded. And we'll be given a score for the quality of our publications, a score for our environment, including research income, and also, interestingly, a score for our impact. How much impact has our research had? And actually, of all those measures, uh, I, 
I'm, I'm interested in the impact measure. That does seem to be sort of shifting some of what we do in a rather different direction. But the picture is a profound change in higher education in England. It's a, it's a picture that's one where you see something that might be called academic capitalism taking hold, a phenomenon that Slaughter and Rhodes identified here in the 1990s, associated originally with things like getting grants, winning prizes, patents, and so on, but now extended across the whole of the higher education system. Okay? The point I'm trying to make is that when we look at teacher education as a higher education activity in this context, you find the past is living on, unsurprisingly. In the present, in the education of teachers, through historically sedimented cultural practices, forms of identification and community, and trajectories of development that are already in process. So in my department, 1966 University, but based on a predecessor college, the Borough Road College, if you go around the area in which we live and work in West London, you will find teachers who call themselves Borough Road teachers. And you will find people in my department who did not apply to be research active teacher educators in a comprehensive research university. They came in for different motivations. They came in with a different identity in view. So this leads me to talk about the work of teacher education studies that I've done with Jane McNichol, Alan Blake, and Jim McNally. The work was in two phases. It was funded by the Higher Education Academy in the UK. Uh, the partners were the University of Oxford and Brunel University, Strathclyde University, and since we started publishing the work, Australian Catholic University and Victoria University in Melbourne have started to replicate the studies and publish, and then the New Zealand Otago University and the University of Auckland have also joined in, and they're also generating data in relation to our questions. And the question that kind of drove this was the one that we ask ourselves a lot. If you meet someone in the corridor, what are you working on at the moment? And there's, an, there's a right answer to that, which is something like a post-structural account of this, that, or the other, informed by the work of Foucault, whatever. The, the, wrong, the wrong answer is I'm marking 120 essays. The wrong answer is I'm doing five school visits. The wrong answer is I'm finding it very difficult to get a day together for a dissertation continuity. So we tend to think in purely intellectual terms, and what my colleagues and I were interested in was trying to ground that a bit. What does it mean to do the work of teacher education? So we shared these recent empirical and theoretical interests in studying academic work as labor that was taking place within specific social and material conditions. We have these specific theoretical interests in the socio-historical um, organization of human activity, Activity theory derived from Vygotsky Engels from the bottom line of that triangle, if you've ever seen the triangle, which includes this concept of the division of labor. Who gets to do what work and why? And also personal and professional interests in what we as teacher educators do, what we're asked to do, and why. The background to this you'll be very familiar with. I've put some references on here from Australia and from Europe, but I mean, one of the great books I read was Stanley Aronovitz's book about the kind of factory model of higher education in the United States. This awareness that what we're doing is at work, and it's, as you scale it up, it is more industrialized. But also this quotation from Enders, who did a study of higher education labor across Europe to try to find out if there were things in common, and actually came up with the idea that looking across Europe, that might be an illusion if we think that what goes on in one place is rather like what goes on in another. Also, this consideration that what we do has consequences that work that reach further than ourselves. Um, teacher educators' work creates some opportunities for teacher development and it limits others. The work of teacher education, at least in part, produces teachers and teaching, and that is a deliberately manufacturing metaphor that I'm using. In the UK context, just so you're aware, the UK has four separate jurisdictions, uh, England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. You would have probably seen on the news the independence debate about Scotland a few weeks ago. 
In England, we've had statutory teacher training partnerships for pre-service teacher education since 1992. Our qualification is the PGCE. It's a one-year, nine-month course. 24 out of 36 weeks are spent in the school. In Scotland, there are still school university partnerships, but they don't have the same statutory force. In both Scotland and England, the majority of workers in higher education education departments don't have PhDs. They're not deemed research active, and the majority of those workers in, in education departments are teacher educators. And they come in, like me, to do the work of teacher education. If you look at academic workers in higher education departments in England and Scotland and Wales as a whole, this is from the Higher Education Statistics Agency in England, um, you find that academic workers in education are older than other social scientists because we've usually had a career before we come in. Uh, we have shorter academic careers. We are less likely to be from minority groups or non-UK nationals and other social science areas. We're more likely to be female. We're more likely to be on lower pay scales and lower rank. And a greater proportion of us than other social sciences will be on casualized contracts. So that's the kind of demographic of the group, the workforce of teacher educators um, in the UK as a whole. In phase one of our study, we analyzed job descriptions and advertisements for jobs. And to make sure that we weren't doing a study of casualization, what we did was we focused exclusively on full-time and permanent jobs that were advertised as academic jobs. So we weren't doing a study of adjunct faculty. And we found in our period 111 job advertisements and recruitment texts, and we also did interviews with a small sample of the deans or the department chairs that have advertised those jobs. Remember, these are academic contracts, teaching, research, and service. In this country, they would be tenure track positions. 45% of those teacher education positions did not mention research at all in the job specification. 45%. And when we said this initially at some conferences in the UK, people said, ah, but I bet the Russell Group universities or the Ivy League, I bet they specified research. No, they didn't. There was no association with type of university, and we found the same phenomenon in the old, rather elite universities as we did in the kind of modern universities uh, that are the, where the majority of teachers are educated. Our research questions in the second phase were, what is the higher education-based teacher's work? What are their typical professional activities? And what are the material conditions in which they carry them out? And we're also interested in uh, trying to understand how, how higher education-based teacher educators talk about their work. So over the course of one year, with a small sample of 13 teacher educators at a range of universities in England and Scotland, we collected documents, we did interviews, we did participant observation, including still photography, we asked them to complete work diaries at two points in the year, and we concluded the project with participatory data analysis workshops. And the point of those was not to get respondent validation of what we were thinking, but to try to extend the analysis a bit and to lift it. We found when we analyzed the work diary instruments, um, a range of activities that through a series of iterations we married, managed to narrow down to 10 job dimensions. And these are there, you'll see things like course management, personnel activities, examining, marking, professional development, research, working with a group of students, i.e. teaching, and tutoring an individual student, academic supervision, lesson observation, and so on. And we also, following the um, participatory data analysis workshops, came up with a category that we called relationship maintenance. And originally that was admin. But when we burrowed down into what admin actually meant, it looked actually like something else, and our participants were very good at helping us to come to that understanding. We did our stats because we like to do mixed methods work to make sure that our, our research is robust. But what we found in our sample was over the two periods, everybody did a large proportion of relationship maintenance, and very few people did any research. 
So what is this relationship maintenance thing? It's communicative activity directed at maintaining and repairing relationships with schools and between schools and student teachers under the heading of partnership. And if you'd see my out of office message as Celia and, and Lynn have, you'll know that I have about five choices on it for who to contact while I'm away if anything goes wrong. But we think that's partly related to the position of partnership in teacher education in the UK. It's not exclusive to the UK or to England, but we think the way that partnership has been conceptualized in the English system is an important part of this. So in our sample, the work of teacher educators appears to be high in time to relationship maintenance, which appears to be the consistent defining characteristic of the work. And again, there were no differences apparent between types of institution. We had a real range. We had a range that went from what you would call community colleges through to elite research intensive universities. There were also no differences between England and Scotland. And if you talk about this in the UK, people expect England to be different because it's got this hard line inspection system, but no. And in fact, if you look at the international research literature, Joanne Dillibert, Sandra Acker are writing in Canada and they find the same phenomenon. Dan Liston, writing in the US in Wisconsin, finds the same phenomenon. Meg Maguire, 20 odd years ago in England, the same phenomenon. Teacher educators are an occupational group that keep the system going. They keep education departments going. Dan Liston called it housekeeping. He called it women's work. In fact, I think he said at one point, we are all women now if we're a teacher educator. But that kind of domestic work of keeping an institution going and running has been an internationally identified phenomenon and it's associated with a large number of women who work in academic positions in teacher education. We came up with three risks for the importance of relationship maintenance in our research. And they are English reasons, but they might have wider relevance, I think. One is the reputational risk to the university brand of poor outcomes in quality assurance and inspection resumes in what is a managed but still is a higher education market. If your programs get known to be unsympathetic to the needs of student teachers or you don't pay attention to what schools say, then the schools will pull the ultimate sanction, which is to not work with you anymore. The other reason is a very strong one we found in some situations, culture shock, what Peter Smagorinsky calls praxis shock, which is when research and evidence-based teacher education collides with politically driven reforms. So we here in this institution, you, I back home, may say, we think this is probably a good way that you might approach the teaching of this or that. And the evidence says this, and we've done this research that kind of illuminates that. And the student teacher goes into a school and says, actually, we're not doing that here. This is the way we do it here. And the outcomes that we observed when we followed teacher educators around was enormous stress on the part of those student teachers who were committed to both. They're committed to the research and evidence form of knowledge that they're introduced to in school, but they're also committed to make a difference to students in the schools in which they're on placements and learning to teach. But we also did notice this residual identity as a school teacher and the historical training college educator intersecting with projective identities as a research active university based teacher educator. And actually our sample was very good at articulating that. And they would say things like, if I've got the choice between writing a grant or a paper, or picking up the phone, or writing an email, and knowing I can sort a problem out, I'll do the latter, because I get a greater sense of reward from it. So what we didn't want to do with this project was to somehow say that there's a kind of an oppressive policy regime uh, that somehow kind of positions us awkwardly, and, and, and that's it alone. We wanted to try to get a better understanding of how it is that these issues intersect with these historical identities that we have both recently as teachers and then over a longer time frame as a teacher educator from a different sort of culture. And the phenomenon that we felt was a consequence was proletarianization. And when we started talking about this, people were very upset because they thought that it meant that you were sort of, well, a prole, you know, that you were somehow a lower class citizen. 
But actually, we went back to the Marx. We went back to people who'd studied academic labor. And it's about capital, and it's about value. And this is a quotation from John Gilorley, who did a study of literature scholars in the humanities department. The talk embodied in intellectual labor can be released in either direction. That is to say that knowledge like money is only capital when it is capitalized, when it produces the effect of en bourgeoisement. And conversely, that knowledge can be devalued in such a way that its possessors become indistinguishable from wage labor, a process of proletarianization. And what we found in our study, and Sandra Acker, Joanne Dilliver, Meg McGuire, Dan Liston, and others have found, is that the knowledge that teacher educators have isn't capitalized. It is devalued. And other kinds of knowledge and other kind of activities are valued within the exchange relations you find in contemporary higher education. Now, we're not the first to describe a process of proletarianization. Stephen Ball, Martin Lorne, Jenny Osger designed the same process in the 1960s and the 1980s, rather, in relation to teachers in schools. Uh, Marx and Engels, when they talked about proletarianization, also referred to doctors. They referred to scientists, also subject to the same process. The wider consequence to start with is that if teacher educators and the activity of teacher education isn't accruing capital, it isn't accruing value, within these exchange relations, then teacher educators aren't having as much impact as they would have otherwise on the system, on the schools and the profession, as well as on their own careers. So it's not a kind of complaint or a special pleading for teacher educators as a category of worker. That's not what it's about at all. We recognize that teacher educators do have a degree of freedom in their concrete labor practices. They are not necessarily on the poverty line but they're not making as much of a difference as they might to the process of teacher education if things were organized differently. And the consequence that we've seen in England is a decline, and this has been measured by these RAEs, the research assessment exercises, a decline in critical research and evidence-based teacher education. We see it as much more technical, more, more vocational, more driven by ticking boxes and meeting standards. We also see a decline in the output and quality of specifically educational research. So when we looked in the 2008 RAE, you saw a decline in research that was based on subject pedagogies, curriculum, developmental research. You saw a rise in things like experimental studies involving randomized control trials. You also saw continued strengthening of sociological positions, but you saw a decline in the pedagogical. And we see the so all of this is contributing to the growing isolation of schools in England, disconnected from other schools, the disappearance of local authorities and school districts, and the isolation of teachers, the individual teacher, rather than a member of a profession. So finally, in the book, we come up, we try to come up with a transformative agenda. We come up with five principles and three actions. I think the principles have a wider relevance. The actions may be more specific to England, and I hope you tell me. The first principle is that higher education institutions, universities, are public institutions. I believe that whether you're privately funded or funded by the state. They have democratic functions that merit relative autonomy, and they require academic freedom to be sustained in order to complete their work in society and specifically make a qualitative difference to the preparation of teachers for schools. In England, we have seen higher education being used as a gatekeeper to the job of teaching on terms prescribed by the state. The degree to which we have handed over control over our curriculum and control over our standards to the state is quite remarkable. And that would be difficult, but not impossible, to argue back. But in terms of our, our program or our agenda, we believe this is an important starting point in terms of articulating a future for higher education and teacher education within it. Secondly, it's about the discipline we work in. The discipline of education in universities can and should model 
the difficult integrative balance between professional knowledge, policy knowledge, critical knowledge, and reflexive knowledge required of all disciplines and should seek new associations and new relationships inside and out of the academy in order to realize this balance. And there are moves afoot elsewhere in higher education that can support us in these efforts. So Michael Burrowoy, in a recent book edited in England by um, John Holmwood, Reinventing the Public University, came up with what he felt were the functions of the public university in terms of knowledge. And what I did last year was to try to reframe these in terms of teacher education. So if you look at that um, table, it recognizes that there are many kinds of knowledge for many purposes in audiences. There are the kinds of what you might call instrumental knowledge, the kind of knowledge that's necessary to get things done. And in order to get work done, we need to do that within the profession. And we also need to have a dialogue with policymakers. In other words, we have an academic audience and we have an extra academic audience. But also, there's the kind of reflexive knowledge that's associated distinctively with higher education. The critical knowledge that is debated and deliberated within institutions like this one. But also, reflexive knowledge that's deliberated within the wider society. So what Burrowai tried to do with this diagram, and I've tried to do for teacher education, is to recognize that we actually need to be a lot more outward looking. Outward looking not just to the profession, and not just willing to listen to the profession rather than deliver our research findings to them, but also to listen to the wider publics, different communities, families, and children. So it's a different way of understanding knowledge functions within teacher education within the public university. The third principle, and we said at the beginning, and in, we do strongly in the book, that this question cannot be addressed by focusing solely on higher education and academic workers, although that's our primary interest. It needs to be, uh, there needs to be a, a re-stimulation, a reinvigoration of the profession as a collaborative community deserving of the distributive agency afforded by an enabling welfare state and with responsibilities for the development of the collective professional creativity that makes a positive difference to the education of young people in schools. It's interesting, the term distributed agency is a term that Raya Maitinen from Finland uses when he tries to explain the success of the Finnish school system. It's about trust. It's about distributing trust and agency across the profession, creating the conditions for teachers and teacher educators to develop things over a long period of time. And that's perhaps what's distinctive about the Finnish success story is the distribution of agency and the time scale. In the book, we draw on um, Adler's work. He's a sociologist of professions in looking at different models or organizing principles for profession. Community is an organizing principle, market is an organizing principle, and hierarchy is an organizing principle. And in looking at the strengths and weaknesses of those, we align ourselves with Adler, who proposes the collaborative community. Again, outward looking, but not forgetting that markets do exist, that there is such a thing as capital, that there are historical forms of community, and schools as well as universities do tend to be hierarchical organizations with strong lines of accountability. The relationship between higher education and schools around the preparation of teachers might be understood as co-configuration of new forms of activity rather than merely structural partnerships and channels of communication. And in this principle, in our last chapter, we talk about in England, the word partnership has sort of lost its meaning. It's come to mean something very instrumental, how you just communicate by email or phone with people. We've lost the meaning of collaborative partnership that John Furlong kind of talked about 20 years ago. So we use the activity theory term of co-configuration. And co-configuration comes from Engelstrom's work to talk about different actors, different organizational groups coming together to work on a common problem. So they come together to work on a, prompt, uh, a common problem. 
on a temporary basis, bringing different knowledge, different resources, different expertise, before going back and dealing with the primary objects, children in school, teaching children, working in the university. So we make an argument for thinking of what teachers, professionals, and higher education might do together as co-configuration rather than partnership working. And finally, in terms of a principle, co-configuration rather than partnership lends itself to a model of research that's known as mode two. It's the kind of research and development that has systemic impact, as well as having benefits for all collaborators, including university or higher education based teacher educators. So mode two, knowledge production, is already something that people are aware of in other parts of the university. So in my university, with a strong engineering tradition, the engineers know all about this. Mode two knowledge production is what they do. So one of my colleagues at Brunel is researching refrigerator doors. How to make your refriger refrigerator door close more effectively, as well as being a beautiful refrigerator door. And in order to do that, you need to work with refrigerator users. And you need to think about aesthetics. But you also need to think about politics, the sustainability. You need to think about the way that the refrigerator works to minimize impact on climate. So they are complex, knotty problems. And the people who came up with this idea, led by Michael Gibbons in 94, distinguished between two modes. Mode one, determined by academic interests primarily cognitive and orientation, hierarchical, prizing autonomy. By contrast, mode two is characterized by heterogeneity, transdisciplinarity, social accountability, and reflexivity in hybrid social practices that are at the same time academic, non-academic, instrumental and critical, personal and political. Mode two, knowledge production, is context-driven, problem-focused, interdisciplinary. It's research carried out in the context of application with those who will work with it. Now, there was a great deal of interest in mode two, knowledge production, a while ago, and there were some fairly kind of limited appropriations of it. So Helga Nowotny, in 2003, came back to look at it again. And she used the metaphor of the agora, the marketplace in Greek. This is where, and if you're a Vygotsky, you might call it the zone of proximal development. It's the problem generating and problem solving environment in which the contextualization of knowledge production takes place. It is populated not only by a raise of competing experts and the organizations and institutions through which knowledge is generated and traded, but also by various jostling publics. It is not simply a political or commercial arena in which research priorities are identified and funded, nor an arena in which research findings are disseminated, traded, and used. The Agora is a domain of primary knowledge production through which people enter the research process and where mode two knowledge is embodied in people and projects. And in the book, we make an argument that this is a model that exists elsewhere in higher education, that people are familiar with, that is likely to be of use to us in teacher education and education more widely. We finish with three actions, and these actions may be the things that are most specific to England. But we believe that to create the conditions, we as teacher educators need to be a little bit more present in the public sphere and make stronger arguments. John Furlong, in his recent book in England, Education, the Anatomy of a Discipline, talks about how silent we've been. Well, we've allowed people to come in and tell us what to teach and how. The second action, designing professional learning around complex understandings of practice. Practice-based teacher education is a really hot topic, but what does practice mean? Magdalene Lampert wrote a very nice essay about the meaning of practice in practice-based teacher education. But the key thing is it's probably something, practice that is, that we need to keep in motion. It's not something that we necessarily need to pin down, define, laterally transfer as a routine or a move or a high leverage instructional practice. So we argue in the book for a complex understanding of practice, and we think teacher educators that might be based in higher education settings have an important contribution to make. And thirdly, 
rebuild our research program in teaching and teacher education around theory building, cross-setting intervention research. Theory building because we retain the commitment that that might enable people to take more control. It might enable people to have wider application of good ideas. Cross-setting intervention research is something that's been proposed recently by Chris Gutierrez and Bill Pennell, an educational researcher. It's the kind of research, actually, that Christine Sleater thinks is the kind of research policy makers want. They don't really want randomized control trials that don't give you any idea of what it was that made the difference. Uh, policy makers seem to want, certainly in England, the kinds of things that will tell you how that happened and how it might happen consistently. So the book moves to the final stage of sort of giving an agenda. As I said, it, it puts itself um, forward on the basis of our research in England, but also perhaps a little bit more widely. Uh, and we do so feeling that we're not being defensive about what's happened. Uh, Jane Adams, one of your great social pioneers, writing 1899, wrote this about higher education. And it's a shift that we see and we agree with in our own work in England. As the college changed from teaching theology to teaching secular knowledge, the test of its success should have sifted from the power to save men's souls to the power to adjust them in health relations to nature and their fellow men, writing at the time, obviously. But the college failed to do this and made the test of its success the mere collecting and disseminating of knowledge, elevating the means into an end and falling in love with its own achievements. In this college, you had a professor, Maxine Green, that used the words of Adrian Rich as a call to arms. And Maxine Green was very fond of using a poem called Transcendental Etude by Adrian Rich, um, written in 1977. And I wanted to use it to close but with a different intention to Maxine Green, because this isn't a call to arms so much as a call to us to do things differently. And it's towards the end of the poem in which she's thinking through what it means to know ourselves differently. And she wrote, there come times, perhaps this is one of them, when we have to take ourselves more seriously or die, when we have to pull back from the incantations, rhythms, we have moved too thoughtlessly and disenthrall ourselves, bestow ourselves to silence or a severer listening, cleansed of oratory, formulas, choruses, laments, static crowding the wires. We cut the wires, find ourselves in freefall, as if our true home were the undimensional solitudes, the rift in the great nebula. No one survives to speak new language has avoided this the cutting away of an old force that held her rooted to an old ground, the pitch of utter loneliness where she herself and all creation seem equally dispersed, weightless, her being a cry to which no echo comes or can ever come. The phrase no one who survives to speak new language has avoided this makes me think we have to do things differently. I'm not asking for us to do to defend what's gone on in the name of teacher education, and I'm not asking for us to align ourselves with the reformers and the reformers' movement. But there's clearly a time to transform what we do that's not only good for us in teacher education and for future teacher educators, but that's better for schools, it's better for the profession of teaching, and it's better for young people.